is that people take it to redline and they're actually going slower and then they hit the next gear. So they're quite literally slowing themselves down. Please subscribe to help you and your motorcycle perform better. Let's take a look at gearing on the 400 because it's gonna go through several iterations. So this is a topic for consideration for the bike based on what we're gonna do with it in the future. Our standard gearing is 1441 and the swing arm length from center of pivot point to the axle is 21 inches or 535 millimeters. If I'm gonna look for economy, I need to bring the RPMs down. And what that means is <clears throat> the rear wheel needs to turn slower. There's a couple ways to do that. If you want the rear wheel to go slower, you bring the size of the sprocket down. And so what we'll get is less RPM. At that point, that's gonna give us potentially better economy. But we have a 400 with 40 something horsepower. Question is, if you drop that many teeth and it's only a couple, can the engine pull? Does it have the strength to pull that gearing and make it work? Consideration should always be, okay, I wanna save some money. Can your engine cope with what you're trying to make it do? Be interesting challenge to see what the 400 could do if we were gonna focus on economy for commuting, duty, road testing, stuff like that, whether that sprocket would work. The other part is, if you drop two teeth here, then you're gonna go longer. So usually two teeth works out to be about 10 millimeters. So, so that would be 520. We would go longer, so that would be 545. And let's say 21.5 inches for argument's sake. So now we just made our wheelbase longer, gave it more stability in doing so, but we took away some agility. Well, if all we care about is fuel economy, we are not strafing canyons and having fun and riding the bike at speed on the weekends. We're not doing that, so it doesn't matter. So lengthening the wheelbase makes sense. We might get a two for one there, especially when you're commuting, so the bike isn't so twitchy. It's actually a lot more stable. So there could be a win-win there if our focus is gonna be economy. If we're looking for that, a very traditional change up is negative one, 13, plus two, or even plus three. So let's go plus three and make it 44. Now, if you keep the stock chain, what's that gonna do over here for your wheelbase? Rear sprocket's way bigger, front sprocket's slightly smaller. So what you're actually gonna do is draw your wheel forward that direction. So you might be at 520. In which case, everything's crammed in, the wheel's as far forward as it can go because the chain cannot be altered in its length. And because it cannot be altered, everything's gonna get crunched up. Question is, will the chain even allow this type of gearing change this big? Because if it's too big, you won't even be able to get the chain onto the sprocket to get the wheel in because it's gonna hit the center of the swing arm. So you're out of luck. And a lot of times when riders change gearing like this for performance, they also change number of links in a chain. So if you had 114 links, they'll go to 116, maybe 118 links to extend the wheelbase to get drive performance and to try and get stability as well. Now, if you look at this either way you want to do it based on what you're going to use your motorcycle for, that's all good. But when you lengthen your wheel brace, you increase the amount of leverage on the swing arm and you change how the shock works. So you may find that when you're on the gas, the bike runs wide because you went so far back in your rear axle that now that 12 inch breaker bar turned into a three foot breaker bar. And in that case, way easier to leverage the shock and blow through the stroke. 
there are consequences and you also then have to go, okay, I did this. Now let's go out and write it. And what is the real world effect of the change I made? And is that consequence adverse to me in the motorcycle? Or <clears throat> is that change actually a very good positive change that the bike handles way better because the wheelbase got shorter? Now, if you're working with a stock bike, there isn't a whole lot of room to come forward. There's a lot of room to go backwards. So bear that in mind. The other piece that's very important here, if you're going for performance, that's absolutely critical. Where's your dyno chart? Doesn't mean mapping the bike. It means where's your power curve? Is your power curve short and quick enough? Is your power curve slow and gradual and tapering? Is your power curve a straight line and then a drop off a cliff? Based on this, when you hit the end point, what are your RPMs? Because as a rider, unless you have trained your ear to hear the RPMs, you're looking at a shift light to learn it so that you know the sound. But when you're running gearing, especially if you're going to the track, one thing is we don't care about top speed. We only care about top speed for that specific track. So our gearing chart tells us that X combination gets us to 160 miles an hour. Well, at that track, I only hit 150. So if I get in a draft, that's gonna give me another seven to 10 miles an hour, is that gonna be enough? So there's that part to take in as well. If you're on a tight technical track, then your top speed is significantly less. If you're on a long track like Utah Sports Campus, or formerly known as Miller Motorsports Park, you're doing 180 miles an hour, then your gearing has to give you a little more than 180 because you've got to take that top speed into concern. In doing that, with your dyno chart, you need to know and recognize that at this number of RPM, you need to shift because that's a one second choice between thought and action. If you are using your shift light, if that is 12K, then maybe at 11 or maybe even at 10, that shift light starts blinking to tell you to shift before you drop off a cliff or you flatten out or worse, you go slower. A lot of riders with gearing, I have to have these gears because in this corner I need third gear, not second, and I'm between both gears, my gearing's wrong, it's really frustrating. Well, where are you in the RPMs before you shift? Do you know? It's not good enough to say, oh, I'm just gonna, I think I'm gonna go to a 15 front from a 14 because I'm between second and third. A change on the front by a single tooth is about 2.5 on the rear. So if I went 13 up to 14, then technically that would be another two and a half teeth on the rear sprocket. <clears throat> So there's various combinations there that you've got to consider, but the most important is on your downer chart and power curve. Because if you're not setting your gearing to this based on the track you ride at and the RPMs you should be at in the corners, then everything you're doing is pointless because you're not honoring the way your bike makes power. The other part that's pretty frustrating is that people take it to red line and they're actually costing themselves somewhere around a second to two, two and a half seconds per lap because they're nose diving off the power curve and they're actually going slower and then they hit the next gear. So they're quite literally slowing themselves down going to red line. If you're serious about your motorcycle and if you're gonna start doing track days, and specifically if you're gonna race, if you don't have your power curve and work your gearing to your power curve, you are literally wasting time on track because you need to leverage every facet of information you can get. Be diligent, get the information, look at a broad spectrum of information, pick what's going on, and then start diving into the details. But number of links, the teeth you use, front and rear, are all critical components in regards to wheelbase length, swing arm angle, and how you valve and spring the rear shock. 
Dave Moss can tune your suspension no matter where you are on the planet via his remote tuning service. Contact Dave on Facebook or by email, dave at davemosstuning.com.